Hello, I'm Dr. Maria Solindro, uh, specializing in integrative anti-aging medicine, practicing in Pasadena, California. Today, my guest, special guest is returning speaker, Dr. Daryl Solindro. I would like to thank every one of you who subscribe, like, and share. And uh, it I, I really greatly appreciate that, okay? I would like to introduce my guest speaker. Hi, Dr. Darrow. Hi, Dr. Maria. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you. And thank you for pres being present today. And uh, I would like to introduce you. And then uh, before I start, I also would like everyone to know that you can ask questions in the chat box. And you know where the chat box is. And also, uh, we have two a guest as a testimonial patients that will be uh, giving testimonial for their experience in their joint pain treatment. Dr. Daryl Solindro is a physician, completed uh, and became board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation specialty. After his long years of staying in beautiful New York, Manhattan at Mount Sinai uh, Hospital, he came back to his home state, California. He pursued his fellowship training in interventional pain management at the University of uh, California in Irvine. Currently, he's practicing interventional pain management <clears throat> at uh, Biohealth Pain Management in Londell, Los Angeles. Dr. Darrell, area of expertise and interests are in regenerative medicine, neuromodulation, and minimally invasive spine intervention. Am I correct this time, <laughs> Dr. Darrell? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. Thank you again for uh, having me on your YouTube channel and inviting me to speak about our common areas of interest. Uh, thank you. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to have you and your new, uh, new um, knowledge in this field because uh, pain management has, um, has become one of the uh, most talkable to topic because 60% of uh, American, they have pain. Uh, believe it or not, is now is the 65 years old uh, population are growing up. Now, today's topic of falls easily within the area of our expertise as a physical medicine. The topic is joint pain and what to do. There's so many joints in our bodies. Luckily, not every joint moves or movable, okay? And the most common joint pain is in the knee joint because you're using them almost every day and everywhere you go, everywhere you move. Dr. Darrell, if I have knee joint pain, many listeners would like to know if this is the same as an osteoarthritis problem. Yeah, osteoarthritis is definitely one of the most common causes of knee pain, but not all causes of knee pain are osteoarthritis. So osteoarthritis is really a degenerative procedure where you have a bone growth and loss of cartilage and loss of support that causes pain in the knee joint. And it's traditionally a cyclical process of inflammation and swelling, which goes away, but causes degradation of the joint. So in this uh, Slide, uh, Dr. Maria, if you could um, allow me to oh, yes, uh, share yes, a screen. One moment. Mm -hmm. Sure, I, I need to release this. Share screen, share screen. Go ahead and try. Yeah, so here okay. on my screen share, as you can see, um, the, there's a lot of components that make up the knee, right? You have different tendons that make up the knee. So you have the quadriceps tendon, which becomes a patella tendon, which inserts into the bone. You have, you know, ligaments in the knee. You have the meniscus, which is almost like a little bit of cartilage shock absorber in the knee. And you also have the knee joint itself. And on the right here, you have different bursas. So bursas are like pockets of fluid, which help kind of the moving parts of the tendons 
and ligaments uh, uh, move correctly. So all these components can have uh, caused knee pain. So it's really important to have a good diagnosis of why you have pain because not all treatments are the same. So for example, you know, a lot of people, especially younger women, especially runners, they have some pain in their patella, in their patella area, especially the superior lateral aspect. And that one aspect of that is called patella femoral syndrome. And it's caused on how the different stressors on the kneecap by the patella tendon uh, happen when they do these range of motion. So that treatment is very different than a treatment of someone who has osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, there are other causes such as ligamentous injuries. So for those of you that follow sports, uh, you've heard of maybe an ACL tear or a PCL, and those are ligaments in the knee which help stabilize the knee. And they can have, if you have trauma, that can cause um, instability and uh, tears of the ligament, and that can be cause of knee pain, which again, the treatment for that is very different than the treatment for osteoarthritis of the knee. So overall, it's very important to know the diagnosis and the source of what's causing your knee pain. And this way we can treat your knee pain appropriately. Oh, thank you so much. And um, wow, that's a good uh, explanation. And once you know the diagnosis and uh, the, difference, the differential of whatever caused it is good, but they want to also know what is the most common cause of this knee pain? And would they sh uh, should I be worried about it? No, I don't think for the most part that most people should be worried about knee pain. There are a co couple things that you should be worried if you have knee pain is if your knee pain happens all of a sudden, you know, if, you're, if you never had a history of knee pain before and suddenly without any fall, without any trauma, without any what we call an inciting event, you have knee pain. That's when you want to consider you know, going to a doctor and figuring out what's going on. Other worrisome ideas is if you have knee pain, but you also have issues with any weakness, that's important to know. And also if you have knee pain with any in systemic signs like fevers, you know, chills, that can be signs that it's like a more inflammatory process. So other than the degenerative causes of knee pain, there are other causes of knee pain. There's infectious arthropathy, meaning that you had an infection somewhere in your system and the, the bacteria decided to seed into your knee joint. And when that may cause uh, resulting fevers with that, you have autoimmune joint pain. So usually when that happens, you can have swelling in multiple joints all at the same time. So one of that, that's when you want to talk to a doctor if not only your knees, but multiple knee joints at the same time cause swelling. And the other one is if you all of a sudden have knee pain with that's so severe that you can't walk and you have some weight loss issues, you want to make sure that there's no tumor or malignancy like bone cancer into your knee. Oh, wow. That's very clear. Everything localized in all the knee joint. And if you have a sign of infection, you should quickly go and see your doctor. You're right. Very clear. What about osteoporosis? Does this cause uh, knee pain as well, Dr. Darrell? So when we say for, for those of you who, who are wondering what osteoporosis is, osteoporosis is a very common in the United States cause, especially with aging, where your bone mineral density decreases. So basically how dense and how strongly packed your bones are, it decreases. Often it happens to women, it happens to uh, people with vitamin deficiencies, it happens to people who are relatively inactive. And classically osteoporosis, just having this low bone density on its own does not cause uh, joint pain. However, with osteoporosis, you can have osteoporotic fractures. So the fractures itself, so when your bone fractures, that's very painful. Bone is very painful. And when you have a bone fracture, it's very painful. Um, other things that can cause it, sometimes if you have a fracture, you know, this is a picture of a uh, common cause of osteoporosis. Sometimes when there's a fracture and the fracture causes a compression of a nerve, 
you may have nerve pain. So pain that's shooting down, that's burning, that's tingling. Uh, you can have pain with that. But osteoporosis on its own uh, usually does not cause pain. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Very, very good. And um, some, sometimes the osteoporosis that has all those um, microscopic uh, fracture, it's everywhere. So sometimes they feel pain all over the body. Now for preventive measure, we would like to know ahead uh, if we can prevent this one. But first, how do I find out if I have osteoarthritis? Uh, do I need an x-ray to make the diagnosis? Yeah, the most important thing with almost anything in medicine or any, especially in pain medicine, the most important two things are your history and your physical exam. You know, your history or how you came about to this knee pain is very, very important. If you have a history of some knee pain, it gets worse with walking, it's been getting worse with age, you don't really need an x-ray to diagnose you with knee arthritis. Um, so the history is most important, but it, there are some you know, um, uh, radiological factors that we, we can do like an x-ray to grade knee arthritis. You know, the radiologists have created this grading scale called the Kelgren Lawrence grading scale. And, you know, that has, uh, maybe guided some research, uh, to allow us to know what's, uh, moderate, mild, you know, mild, moderate, and severe arthritis. It's called the Kelgren Lawrence scale but you don't really need a knee uh, x-ray to diagnose um, osteoarthritis. And interestingly, um, the x-rays uh, oftentimes don't correlate to how the people are feeling. So you may know many people, uh, especially older people who don't have too much knee pain, but when you get an x-ray of their knee, their x-ray is like a grade four severe knee ar arthritis, but they don't have pain. So it's really important to really uh, listen to the patient and see what they have clinically and not base all your treatment on an x-ray. Now, I normally do get x-rays on my patients before I do an intervention on them. You know, before I want to do an injection or any sort of manipulation on my patient's knees, I do get a knee x-ray just to, just to make sure there's nothing funny, no funny business going on. Mm, yeah. If you do have issues like, you know, buckling when you're walking or uh, unable to bear weight or extremely severe pain or prior to any knee surgery, uh, most people will order a knee MRI. And um, you know this is a lateral view of a knee MRI and you can see the MRI is uh, much, much more extremely detailed than the X-ray. You can see all the tendons, you can see all the ligaments, you can see the fat pad, you can see the meniscus, you can see if there's any inflammation or fluid in the knee. So the MRI is a little more important if you're suspecting that uh, your patient has a meniscal injury, if they're suspecting that they have a ligament injury, if they're suspecting that they have any like inflammatory fluid in their knee. So that's when I would get an MRI of the knee. Mm -hmm. Yes, excellent. Well, I, I, I think um, people by now, nowadays, they know what's the difference, X-ray or MRI. The X-ray, you will see the bones and, uh, and MRI, you will see the so other soft tissue. So uh, that is uh, why we need, sometimes we need MRI because the bone sometimes is good, but then uh, there is an accumulation of uh, 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 fluid on the joint. And also you cannot see uh, clearly like ligaments or anything like that in X-ray. So the most uh, important now is always maintain our uh, health, our optimal health. In my practice, I always emphasize if you have some habit of drinking other than water, like tea, coffee with caffeine, and uh, also sugar, that, that can contribute to the starting of the osteoporosis or uh, 
uh, osteoarthritis. So I always tell my patients that certain enzyme like Boswellia and supplementation food based like a fast joint formula is almost a standard to take care of our joint health. It has a combination of glucosamine and chondritin where all the scientific paper also has been done and it's everywhere. So most orthopedic surgeon agrees that that is also good to take. But other than that, what can we do to maintain our joint health, Dr. Darrow? Yeah, thank you for all that information. Uh, you know, I definitely should listen to you more <laughs> since I drink coffee almost every single day to maintain my state of mind at work. But um, yeah, there are a couple uh, evidence-based proven things that we can do to maintain joint health, you know, and I think most people know them exactly, you know, avoid toxic chemicals. So such as smoking, uh, drinking copious amounts of alcohol and drugs, um, maintain a healthy lifestyle, including load bearing exercises. So basically gravity bearing exercises, just such as walking or riding the bike, you know, and also things like um, eating an anti-inflammatory diet. So a diet a little bit less in, you know, red meats or animal products, maybe less barbecued products and a little bit higher in omega-3s. Uh, those are important for like a preventative uh, standpoint. Um, and other than that, I mean, it, kind of osteoarthritis and degenerative knees are a process of, a process of, of aging. But it's important to say that people who have a stronger exercise regimen, even though they on x-ray or on MRI, they have worse knees, they often experience much less pain. Really, it's okay to have a degenerative joint as long as there is no pain and it doesn't impact your quality of life. Other things that you can do from a preventative measure, I know some uh, places they've been uh, supplementing their knees with either hyaluronic acid or like a regenerative procedure like platelet-rich plasma or even bone marrow aspirate, even well before they start developing pain, when they start having those signs of degenerative disease, uh, some places and patients are requesting to have the supplementation and more of as a preventative measure rather than as a treatment. Yes, yes. I am into that preventative measure, like you know that. And, you know, thank you for mentioning exercise. Uh, I like that exercise and, and also the omega-3. Now, let me talk a little bit about that, um, that, that omega-3. When you have pain in the joint or let's say um, mostly in the small joint, and you can test if your uh, omega-6 is higher than omega-3 or the ratio is different, uh, uh, off by adding more omega-3. Just when you buy, don't just look into like a fish oil. You know, it, it, omega-3 is a, a combination of uh, two uh, essential fatty acids. So it's an EPA and DHA. And the rest is uh, probably omega-6, omega-9. So you buy adding like um, doing a little bit more like more generously of omega-3 can, can reduce the arachidonic acid um, accumulation in the joint and reducing the pain. So the pain is from the arachidonic acid instead of from the omega-3. So that is a good test. For example, if you take omega-3, like Vasepa, which is prescribed, you know, now they cover, thank God that the, you know, Medicare, Medical, they cover Vasepa, uh, which is a very good EPA, a thousand milligram, but don't just take one. I know the a cup gel is very big, take three or four or even five or six. Okay, just take it for two or three days. If you experience less pain, then you know the pain can be not from the osteoarthritis, but from a much accumulation of arachidonic acid. And how do you get that? Well, from the diet, like Dr. Daryl said, you know, too much of the acid, of the arachidonic acid. So diet is important. Now for the exercise, I like to exercise. And when I watch my father at age 90 deteriorating because he could not run again, I always appreciate and thank God for a pair of strong legs that I have and my knee joints. So I don't have knee joints problem yet, okay? Walking on the treadmill or tracks keeping me 
very happy. I try not to run due to the microhematuria happening when you run or jog, but what exercise are best to preserve and maintain your knee joints, Dr. Darrell? Yeah, so in general, you want to treat exercise almost like a prescription of a medicine, right? Right. Uh, most exercises that are, 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 are supposed to help your overall health. You shouldn't really do exercises that will only help one body part. You shouldn't only do an exercise only to help a knee or only to help the shoulder. Exercises in general should be a compound exercise. So in, in terms of that, I would say that a mostly what we call a compound exercise program is most beneficial. So basically, if you look on the left side, um, they're compound versus isolation exercises. So you know, these people lifting weights and all this stuff, you don't really have to do that. But compound exercises are exercises that recruit more than one muscle. So when you do a squat or something simple like getting up from a chair, you use multiple muscles. You use your, you know, quad quadriceps muscles, you use your gluteus muscles, you use the medius muscles for stabilization. That's much more effective uh, than just, you know, doing a leg raise to focus on the quadriceps. It's more functional because at the end of the day, exercise is supposed to allow us to do our day-to-day -day activities. You know, you can do a bicep curl all you want, but there's very limited activities that you're just using your bicep. Most of them as a compound exercise. And importantly, there's an ability to share load and share the pressure from it. So I would say compound exercises are more important for your joint health because overall it is more important for your biological health. Um, Yes. Also, in terms of the exercises for joint pain, um, you know, we all undergo joint degeneration, right? And, you know, in the, in the past, it was said that, oh, don't run because it might make your knee osteoarthritis worse because of, you know, microhematuria. And that's true. I mean, a lot of runners who run heavy mileage on imaging like x-ray and MRI do have worse degenerations of the knee. But overall, when you look at the patient themselves, people who are runners, they actually develop knee pain much, much less than patients who don't run. So really, it's a really complex fine balance. So you can, if you're just focusing on the picture, it does cause microhematuria and you know, degeneration of the knee joint. But if you look at the overall picture, people who are runners, they have less knee pain, they have better cardiovascular health, and they potentially live a lot longer. So in general, my, my patients who are runners and say, you know, doctor, should I stop running? I'm uh, afraid of my knee pain. Uh, I tell them to keep running if they have been running for their whole lives. But if someone is in their 60s and they want to do some exercise, I would recommend for them not to pick up running because their body is not conditioned to be a runner. Correct. Correct. That's, that's true. Yes. And the longevity from the compound exercise and muscle strengthening is due to the stimulations uh, of the uh, HGH, human growth hormone. So that is that is why you know I, I agree with you with in that uh, aspect. Thank you so much for bringing that up. Let's have an osteoarthritis uh, as an example. Let's say I have an osteoarthritis, right? That's the most common that cause uh, my uh, pain in the knee joints and, um, and it already interfere with my quality of life. I cannot do much uh, in terms of lifting or uh, walking fast or uh, going up and down stairs, but I don't want the knee surgery. What can I do? I know this is within the area of pain management and physical medicine. Maybe that's the reason why I want to ask these questions. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, you know, I'm, I'm a pain uh, interventional pain specialist. So unfortunately, most of my patients who come to see me are referred from primary care doctors. So most of them have already tried, tried or they don't do preventive measures or it's too late for them. They've all tried physical therapy before they get referred to a pain management specialist. So at this point, they're looking for something more than their physical therapy, weight loss, and preventative measures. So what they can do for patients who, are, who don't want a knee surgery or they're not ready for knee surgery, the next step up are what we call, what I would call the injectable therapies. So there are various injectable therapies that I do 
Um, so these are three of them that I have on the screen. And this is a, a, a picture of a knee injection. For those of you who are nervous about needles, this is a very minimally invasive procedure that I do uh, in my office. For the tough ones, I do it under a fluoroscope or an x-ray. But the classic uh, injectate that we used to do for the last maybe 40 years are corticosteroids, right? So mm -hmm. steroids are a, a, a purified biological compound that it is like a hormone. What it does is it kills all inflammation. Now, the problem with doing that is, yes, it'll make your knee feel better. And if it makes your knee feel better, that you can do proper physical therapy, exercise and weight loss, then yes, it will help your knee pain and arthritis in the long term. However, if you're using it only as a pain blocker and you don't do any exercise with it, over time, the steroids can cause problems for your cartilage. It can cause problems for your ligaments. And if you get it too often, it can also cause metabolic problems in your body. So uh, for most of my patients that come to me, especially using insurance, I do recommend a uh, steroid injection first, only if, if I think they'll be able to do further exercises. For patients who uh, have tried this corticosteroid, or I think really are not a candidate for more like exercise therapy, won't help them any further. The next step on the bottom left, you see that those clear vials of fluid, that's hyaluronic acid. So hyaluronic acid is a gel compound that, uh, you know, for simplicity's sake, I just say increases the lubrication for a knee, but actually it's also regenerative. It supplies the chondrocytes or the cartilage cells with the proper nutrient balance that they can hopefully regrow and buffer the knee and create a little more uh, longevity use out of the knee. And it's basically a gel injection. It can usually ranges from a series of three injections there are some newer formulations that have a uh, one injection, which I use rarely, but that's the other type of injection that I, I, I do for a lot of my patients. We call it visco supplementation, hyaluronic acid. The last one that I do mostly for my patients who really don't want a steroid injection, they have not really responded very well to the gel injections, and they have on imaging mild to moderate knee arthritis is PRP. So PRP is platelet-rich plasma. Basically what it is, it's what we consider a regenerative or biologic therapy where we draw your blood, we use a special centrifuge, and we get the platelet uh, buffer where it's rich in plasma. Um, what it does is it has the factors that your body needs to recruit healing factors to help heal the area of injury, plus it's anti-inflammatory on its own. So it's basically has the anti-inflammatory properties of the steroid, plus it has kind of the growth factors of hyaluronic acid, even better actually. And it helps patients with their knee pain. You know, the data now is a little bit more robust. Uh, they've shown to be non-superior to steroid injections. They've shown to last longer than steroid injections and it's your own body's product. So you have no risk of rejection or uh, um, allergies to the injectate. Uh, there are other compounds out there such as uh, adipose tissue uh, injections, uh, bone marrow aspirate injections. Um, there are some like placental injections or exosomes. I personally don't do those. I feel like uh, from a biologic or regenerative standpoint, the platelet-rich plasma has the most robust evidence so far, which is why I use that the most. And then uh, for those of you who have severe knee pain, severe arthritis, that these injections don't work. We also have what we call more of a salvage therapy, meaning, you know, your arthritis is non-reversible and your pain is so bad. So what we do is we block your pain. So what that is, it's a radio frequency. So basically there are certain nerves in the knee and the nerves, all they do is they sense the pain from the knee. So there's multiple nerves in the knee and they sense the pain from the knee joint. We call that the genicular nerves. So this is a picture of the three common genicular nerves. So what we do is under imaging, be it ultrasound or fluoroscopic guidance, we go down with the spine, a needle, and we inject just a little bit of anesthetic on those nerves. And then you'll be able to feel almost right away that your knee pain goes down by 50% or more. 
Once we know that you are a good candidate for this uh, nerve block, what we do is something called radio frequency. So these are x-ray images of those three nerves and you see the needles at each, each area. And on the tip of that needle, there is a special, you attach it to a generator and it creates a radio frequency field. Usually it's a little bit, a couple of millimeters around the needle tip as well as uh, around the, the 10 millimeters of the needle. And what the radio frequency field does, it heats up the tissue to 80 or 90 degrees Celsius. Basically what it does, it burns those tiny nerves that you know sense pain in the knee. So essentially what we're doing is we're doing a, a more permanent nerve ablation or nerve burn. Your nerves do grow back, but then if this procedure is targeted appropriately with a good landmark guided with the x-ray, if it's uh, done properly, patients have good pain relief more than 50% for eight to 14 months. Wow, thank you. Learn a lot from your picture alone. You have done uh, many good things for this knee pain. If they reduce, uh, this is a really my, my own question. If they reduce a 50% of the pain, what do you do with the other 50%? So, you, you know, it's very complicated because the, the knee has a lot of nerves, right? But yeah. these nerves are the ones we target because they're only sensory nerves. So it yeah. doesn't affect how you walk. It doesn't affect mm -hmm. how you move. There are other nerves that are also motor nerves where they also move your knee. And unfortunately we can't target that. So with the remaining 50%, with the remaining 50% of the pain, you know, uh, for most patients, it's enough pain relief that they can do a more aggressive physical therapy program. Um, and it really is up to the patient if they're not uh, satisfied with, this is not enough pain relief for them, you know, then, you know, th that's when they're going to have to consider uh, a more surgical management. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. For um, for the, what Dr. Dr. Daryl explained, uh, that's a plenty of option already for non-surgical way. And um, for some people who knows that there is a like oxidative medicine um, prolotherapy, like prolozone, where we can also try an ozone injection. And uh, the ozone uh, from the article and the study does uh, trigger the, you know, the healing process and DNA healing. So that will help. And it takes about like two or three injection before you can uh, minimize it to maybe like from zero to 10, 10 as the most painful, it can go down to even one or two. And then it's up to you again, whether you can tolerate one or two or not. And most of the um, people who have knee surgery, Dr. Darrell, if I'm uh, recommended already for knee surgery by the orthopedic surgeon, what should I expect and should I be worried? I don't think you should be worried. I mean, the orthopedic surgeons now are fantastic, but I would say that the knee joint is still one of the trickier joints for them to do compared to like a hip. A hip surgery now, the, the success rates are well above 90 to 95%. The knee surgeries, they, a lot of patients, you know, almost 20 to 30% still have residual pain after a total knee replacement. And the most important thing, if you are wanting or ready to do a knee surgery, is you need to be ready to do six months of really good therapy after. You need to set up that time in your life where you're able to do a good six months of therapy after your surgery, because that really, the surgeon can be the best surgeon in the world, but if you don't set the time to do proper physical therapy based on all the arthrosis, even if they put a knee joint, there's a lot of bleeding into the knee, that can scar up and fibrose and it can cause difficulties in your range of motion and stiffness. And they may even have to do this thing called manipulation under anesthesia, meaning you'll have to go back, they put you under anesthesia, and they basically crunch your knee to break up all the fibrosis. So really the most important thing for your total knee replacement um, is the, the re rehabilitation afterwards. I agree, I agree. It's a post-op rehab, yes. And uh, thank you for this explanation because people out there should know about that because they, they always think that after the surgery, uh, that's it, like uh, three months. But most, like, most likely they will experience the six months to even a little more than six months before they can enjoy their new knees or the bionic knees, I call it. So after the surgery, 
let's say, okay, on their knee joint, usually it's called like total knee replacement, which is very, very popular now. But uh, they still have a lot of pain. After one year, let's say, okay, we give like at least 12 months and uh, I mean the most 12 months and they still have pain where it has passed the recovery time, which is expected, right? And their surgeon says there's nothing they can do to improve it because they have done their best. What can be done then? Yeah, I actually get a lot of referrals from, uh, uh, from surgeons for this issue. We call it post-total knee replacement pain. Uh, patients have this pain for years. It's still severe. Some of them come to me on a lot of narcotics, you know, and there are a couple options that we have now with newer technologies that I like to share. So uh, from before I talked about this radio frequency ablation, this is actually the most common thing that I do for patients after a total knee, because even though you replace the knee with an artificial joint, those nerves that innervate the knee pain, they still, they're still there. They regrow, they're still around the area. So the radio frequency is definitely one of the first things that I try for patients who have failed kind of total knee replacement. For those patients who fail radio frequency even is when we go into a higher level things, which is called neuromodulation. So neuromodulation is the use of technology to uh, you know, stimulate certain parts of the body. So this is neuromodulation to stimulate those nerves of the knee, the same nerves that we did radio frequency on. So this is peripheral nerve stimulation or uh, stimulation of nerves that are not in the spine or the brain. So this is a peripheral nerve stimulation. You know, we put these leads in under x-ray. These leads nowadays, a lot of them are wireless. So the wires all go into the body and the battery or the generator is external. So you may wear it on a strap on your leg. You may wear it as part of your, your knee brace. So this is what we call, you know, the salvage therapy for patients who already have different knee surgeries and who still have pain, neuromodulation for the peripheral nerves is an option. Uh, for me, this is what the next step that I do. And for patients who don't, even with this peripheral nerve stimulation, if they still don't have good pain relief, there are other options. So the next step after that would be uh, what I would call DRG stimulation or spinal cord stimulation of the spine. So you know, all the, all the pain signals, they come from your knees and your joints and they all kind of come in and then they go through your spine before it gets processed to the brain. So uh, this is a DRG stimulation of the L3 nerve root. So the L3 is, you know, the, a lot of the L3 distribution are on the knees. Uh, that's where the, the, the pain pathways come from. So DRG is basically, we put an electrode into the spine around the dorsal root ganglion, which is like the sensory centers of that nerve root. And we do a stimulation of that. And the, the, the battery and the wires are all implanted into your body. So this is a little bit more, uh, I would call like robust pain relief than a per peripheral nerve stimulation, but it's definitely a lot more advanced. And it's definitely a lot more invasive. And, you know, we usually only use these for patients who've tried, you know, radio frequency, peripheral nerve injections and all that thing. But there are options now for patients who have really severe knee pain even after a total knee replacement. What's the DRG stand for? Uh, DRG stands for dorsal root ganglion. It's basically okay. where the nerve comes into a spine, uh, into the spine. There's a little, we call it the dorsal root ganglion where the cell bodies of the nerve, they live. So you mm -hmm. stimulate that area. So is it like uh, when you implant that procedure, this is my question. So when you implant that procedure, do you carry any like a uh, remote control to stimulate it yourself or how is it? Yeah, so uh, nowadays we can do different waveforms, you know, so everything is based on a frequency, an amplitude and a wavelength. So uh, what we do is we do the implant, we do, we do a two-step process. So the first step is a trial. So not everybody is a candidate for this procedure. So we, we uh, kind of like doing an epidural, a little different technique. We slide the wires into your spine and we kind of stick it with an external battery. You, know, you can't really shower for five to seven days. Uh, and you know, you'll have this and you'll basically uh, have a trial run, a tester. 
just like you're buying a car or something, you try out this uh, technology with these wires in your spine and you'll see whether or not it helps your pain. Whether or not it helps your pain, we have to take everything out. But if it does help your pain and you decide that you know, you've know you tried everything else and this is the, the, the something that really helps you, on a later date, uh, we do an implantation. So you'll have about maybe a, a two inch incision in the mid back of your spine and you'll have another two inch incision in your lower back or in your butt where we implant the battery and everything is inside. It's wireless charging or non-rechargeable nowadays. Uh, you have a remote with you and the batteries usually last about eight to 10 years. So you may just have to have another surgery in 10 years just to replace the battery. Wow. So um, what's the success rate of not having side effects like infection and things like that? Do you, so, do you see any problem with the post-implantation infection? Uh, of course. I mean, every surgery has a, a risk of infection. Um, but this is not a joint surgery. You're not replacing a joint. So the, the seeding process is actually very little. There are, there are uh, infection cases. Uh, I had one in my whole year of fellowship. Uh, not my case, but I had to deal with it. Uh, so far, I haven't had any infection rates in mine. I think the literature uh, infection rate is maybe 0.5%, um, but I'm not sure right now. But there are, there are obviously cases of infection. In, in every surgery, there's a risk of infection. But I'm pretty sure that procedure really helps them because otherwise they cannot sleep. Pain is really annoying. And I can uh, relate with that because uh, when I broke my arm, oh my goodness, you know, three weeks, six weeks pain. But uh, thank you for very extensive explanation about what you do over there. And uh, let me see now if there is a questions uh, and we don't have the time, we, we, you can still ask question and I'll, I'll answer uh, later for the people who listen. And now I would like to um, explain who are with us, right? So we have uh, Miss Vicky Carlson and uh, Mr. Don Bennett. Hi Vicky, hi Don. Hello. Hi, thank you for Hello. coming to our uh, conference here, uh, you know, with a short notice, because I, I know that you have had this uh, knee joint uh, injection for a, for a while. Since this is a community awareness, so I would like people to know that this is a, a procedure that is commonly done for a joint knee, uh, for preventive or for treatments. And since you're my patient, I'd like Dr. Darrell to ask you questions. Is that okay? We start with Miss Vicky Carlson, uh, Dr. Darrell. Sure. Yeah. Hi, Vicky. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my first question is, you know, you've had this injection and um, this injection was in your knee joint. Is that correct? Yes. And how did, how, how did we diagnose your, your, your knee joint? Was it through uh, history, listening, or was it really through imaging? Um, I've had knee trouble in the past. In fact, I've had meniscus surgery many years ago, and they took out part of the meniscus, which I hear is not good because it decreases the cushioning. And then I got another meniscus. So I went to Dr. Maria and uh, she did the injections on me. And also she put me on ultra fast joint relief and some Dolorex and the fish oil, the omega threes, collagen, and my knees have been fine ever since. Yeah, that's really great. Um, can you explain what kind of knee injection did you get? Do you know what was injected had, into your knee? I had ozone and I also had stem cells and hyaluronic acid. Oh, that's fantastic. It seems like it's a great treatment. Um, you know, uh, most people are, are a little afraid and they want to know, you know, was the injection painful? Did you have a lot of pain after the injection? No, I had no pain afterwards. Um, and I was able to do my normal activities of daily living. I walked out to my car afterwards and I, you know, I didn't like go to uh, high intensity training at the gym right afterwards, but I did the next morning and my knees were fine. Okay, great. Uh, do you have any pearls of wisdom for patients who are considering a knee injection or who are worried about getting their knees injected? I would say just go for it. It'll make you feel a lot better. 
Okay, thanks a lot, Vicky. We really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Mr. Don Bennett is uh, the next patient. Yes. Hi, hi, Mr. Bennett. How are you? Okay, I'm doing fine. I just uh, Mr. Had, Bennett, I just had eye surgery. That's why I'm wearing the glasses. I just had cataract surgery. A week sure. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, I, I hope you're recovering well with that, uh, Mr. Bennett. Uh, were you also diagnosed with knee problems? Yes. And and how did they figure out what kind of knee problem was it? Well, I was. I used to be a runner, and uh, well, before that, I was a basketball player, and then. So I've always been pretty active and it just started getting getting more painful as I ran. So there wasn't any particular diagnosis, just a, a gradual more and more pain. So I decided, uh, Dr. Mia said, we'll try the injections. And so I get the same thing Vicky did. I didn't do the, uh, I did the stem cell, the hyaluronic acid, and uh, I don't know, is there anything else we put in there? I don't remember, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he, he does have a hyaluronic injection with a Lenex, which is a stem cell in there. Oh, yeah. Yes, remember? You always want that. <laughs> yeah, right. So it, it seemed to help. I, the, uh, now I'm not a runner. I'm a, I'm a hiker now. I hike, I hike the hills in Griffith Park with Vicki when she's able to. Yeah. And, uh, at his age, I, I'm very impressed with all his activities, yes. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, that's I have very little pain. That that's great. I mean, with with uh, the stopping of the running and the hiking, you're actually probably using a lot more of your muscles. You know, uh, the hiking has a lot more lateral movements, a lot more activation of your gluteus and your stabilizer muscles. A lot of runners have really weak kind of side gluteus because they just focus on one kind of straightforward range of motion. So I think the hiking is gonna de definitely benefit your health overall. Um, did, you, did you have a lot of pain during the injection itself or the day after? Just on one side of my knee, there was a little pain. I think she, Dr. Maria said I had a cyst in this one knee. So that caused me a little pain when she would put the needle in. We'd, we'd figure out where, where she could get it in eventually and, and it worked out okay. It was worth the injection, a little pain to, to uh, get the relief. <laughs> yeah. Definitely no pain, no gain, right? Um, any, <laughs> any advice for patients who are considering getting these injections? Um, yeah, I think if you don't look at it, you won't probably notice it uh, as much. <laughs> <laughs> don't look at the needle as it goes in. Just look at the sky or something. <laughs> I think we're afraid of the needle more than we of anything, and it, uh, it may make us think we're in pain or not. <laughs> So I, I, uh, I, the pain is not that, that significant. Okay, thank you, Don. Yeah. Well, thank you, Vicky and Don. You are great. You, uh, we love you. And uh, so, Dr. Daryl, there are not that many uh, questions left, but uh, they, you know, they, they intense, intensely listening to your explanation. That was great. Everyone really like it. And then one question, which is very common, let's just um, answer it. Is that okay? Just sure. One. Okay. What do you recommend for wrist and finger joint pain, which many people have this one? They quarfen tendonitis, you know, they know synovitis. Oh, their quarfen is here at the mm -hmm. rib. Also for finger joints that are a little bit crooked and misaligned, very painful on bone when bump into something. Yeah, so De Corbain's tendonitis is a, te a, a pain in your tendon on kind of like this thumb aspect. Uh, for those of you that are uh, old enough or young enough to remember the Blackberries when we were all using our Blackberries, we used to call it Blackberry thumb because people were on their Blackberries all the time and using, and that uses this tendon a lot. So De Corbain's is really a tendinopathy or inflammation of the tendon. Usually it's because of improper movement. So for that kind of pain, I think a good therapy program or, you know, really modification of usage of your hands uh, to avoid that is important. Uh, I do treat some of them with steroid injections, mostly because they're so painful that they can't function. But some of the uh, PRP injections will be helpful as well for tendinopathies. For joints that are really crooked, I mean, uh, for patients who have polyarthropathy or pain in multiple joints, I always make sure 
that they get multiple labs sent, especially from a rheumatologist, just to make sure they don't have a systemic disease like lupus or you know, inflammatory arthritis. Otherwise, uh, for, for pain in the joints and the hands, I actually recommend to a lot of my patients um, an anti-inflammatory gel or Voltaren gel. You, it's over the counter now that you can buy because that kind of stuff really seeps into, there's not too much fat in the area and that seeps into the layer. Uh, the most common uh, arthritis in the hand is actually the CMC joint, which is the, the, the base of the thumb. It's really just wear and tear. For patients who have a lot of pain in that area, these injectable therapies may help. But unfortunately, based on genetics and your lifestyle, if the arthritis is so bad that it's painful, uh, surgical stabilization and fusion of that joint may be necessary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, I think we passed 20, 20 minutes past, you know, the recommended time. But uh, I, I'm so grateful that we, we can listen to Vicky and John testimonial. Thank you for coming. And thank you again, Dr. Uh, Daryl Slindro. I know uh, you are um, up there in your uh, intervention pain management. For people who wants to see Dr. Daryl, he's practicing at the... Um, What's the name of the clinic, Bell, but, Bell Health? Yeah, I, I work at BioHealth Pain Management. BioHealth Pain Management in uh, Londale, Los Angeles. And for those who are listening today, I'm very grateful for your subscri subscription. And please give thumbs up for Dr. Daryl Sulindro. This is Dr. Maria Sulindro, Integrative Anti-Aging Medicine, practicing in Pasadena, California. If you can go to uh, Facebook, it's the same address, uh, Dr. Maria Aesthetic and Anti-Aging. But for Instagram, we are at Ask Dr. Maria. Thank you so much and see you next week. Thank you, Dr. Daryl. Bye, -bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.